Well, as has been declared uh, already, my, my, my topic is the role of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in these accomplishments uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is uh, quite a large topic to uh, pursue. Uh, as I uh, got into this, I saw that it was larger than, than um, perhaps, uh, well, I knew it was going to be large, but, uh, well, anyhow, we'll just touch the hem of the garment anyhow. And uh, so, and you know, uh, I, I'm speaking to brethren who already know these things, actually, so it's not like we're, we're talking to people that are ignorant. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say... Uh, that this, this expression, uh, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are joined together in one verse. In uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, we said, 14, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. So, so, that's, uh, so now those, uh, those things have been joined together in the mind of the Spirit. See, so, so we uh, whatever you think about that, whatever men think about, whatever men think about that, so that's, uh, but anyhow, I want to talk just for a minute about what men call the Trinity, because that's bearing right on our subject, and it's, in, it's important that we clarify this. Now, I, you, I, you're, I hope there's no eyebrows raised. I'm certainly not teaching against the Trinity, what men are talking, what, what men commonly call the Trinity. But what I'm saying is that uh, when we, when we, uh, formulate our thinking. Every man has to have his own theology. I'm talking about the way you perceive the things of God in your heart. So you've got to, you actually got to shape it yourself. You can't have a prefab theology. You can't buy it from somebody else. You've got it. You can't buy it until, you can't buy it for yourself until you can see it for yourself. See, when, when you can see it, then you can add it to your theology. See, when you can add it, you can add it to your your, understand, your understanding of the Word of God, see? And now when it comes to the Trinity, matters like the Trinity. Now this actually applies to all, all matters in Scripture. We've got to shape, our, our mind and heart have got to be shaped by the very words of the Scripture. We, we can't, when we think about the Trinity, we, we, that, that, you know, I, I, actually, I don't think about the Trinity very much. I mean, I don't in those words, you know what I mean? Because it's not, it really isn't a, it's not a Bible word. But nevertheless, if somebody confronted me, do I, do I believe in the Trinity? I'd say, no, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. And I believe uh, that, that he, uh, that there is a, a life-giving spirit that, that Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, imparts, you know, that, but uh, we, but we've got uh, but anyhow we've got to we've got to we've got to speak the way the scriptures speak. Now, when uh, you know in uh, you know actually this is where we don't actually have to land on on favorite texts. This is all over the place. This is everywhere the scripture talks about these things. Things are always in the right order. See, they're, they're always in the proper order wherever you talk about things. When you talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, it's always in the right perspective. It's always in the right order. Now, here's one, one class example in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Remember, it says, God was in Christ. God was in Christ, see? Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. I want to just talk, uh, I'm just going to talk about a few things before I actually get in, into the, uh, the, the heart of the message here. I want to talk about some scriptures uh, some in the prophets that talk about the Father and the Son. And uh, one of them is in the second Psalm. And this is uh, actually the, uh, actually this is one of those Psalms that uh, is all about Jesus. Say, all about Jesus. See? And uh, it's all about the Father. Actually, it's all about the Father and about the Son. It's, and, but it's about, but see, it's about those two persons of the Godhead. See? Yeah. We're focusing on those two persons. See? And uh, <clears throat> it says, why do the heathen rage? And why do the, the uh, people imagine a vain thing? <clears throat> And uh, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel again, together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now, I'm going to stop right there because that makes my point. Now here, uh, now the, the people, if those people had only known 
who they were gathering together against. It was not just it was just it was not just the car, it was not the carpenter's son. This was this was the Lord of glory. But it was not only that, it was the it was the Lord and against his Christ. The Lord and against his Christ. See, he was actually they were actually coming against both persons of the Godhead. They were confronting both persons of the Godhead, see. Oh, this is, a, this is a not a good place. This is, to say the least, this is not a good position to be in. Then this matter of, uh, you know, the, the, the father and the son, we think of the, in the days of his flesh. Remember there in, I believe it's in, in Isaiah 50, along about in there, you know, it says he wakeneth morning by morning. The father woke up the son. Couldn't wait till the son woke up till he could, so he could talk with him. You know, this was like a trial. You know, the night, the night seasons, I think, were like a, a trial, if, you, if I could speak that way to the father. When, when the son was asleep and, and he, uh, he, he couldn't wait till the morning, he woke, he, woke, he woke up his son so he could commune with him. See, he wakeneth morning by morning. And now here in, the, in Psalm 16, he says that somewhat, uh, he says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel, my reins also instruct me in the night seasons. Now think about that in relation to Jesus. Now when you, when you think about psalm, the Psalms, when you think about them, well, there's a, a lot of the Psalms, well, think about it like this. Some of the Psalms apply only to Jesus. Some of the Psalms apply to you know, there there's psalms that both Jesus and you can identify with. You in Jesus. See, you as you're in him, you can identify with some of those psalms, see? And uh, I'm not going to delineate it any further than that because that, that's going to obscure my point. But this, uh, my reins, thou hast, thou hast instructed my reins in the night season. These were lively reins. I'll just tell you, these, when you think about this communication between the Father and the Son, this, these reins, uh, these reins that were, these were lively reins that were, that were being, uh, you know, active in the night season when the Father was communing with the Son and he was, he was talking things over with the Son in the night season. Here's another one. I'm just kind of, I'm, 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 uh, this is actually part of my addendum, so just uh, bear with me here. And uh, now, some, in Psalm 25, think about this in verse 22. He says, "Redeem O Israel, O God, out of all His troubles." Now, there's two two different perspectives that we can take of that. We can look at it from the perspective of Israel, or the psalmist asking for the redemption of Israel out of all of his troubles, right? But just think about Jesus in the days of His flesh. Now, this was his commission. This was his commission. See, now, the, when he read this, see, in the days of his flesh, when Jesus saw this, it was, this was like the charge that was given to him. Redeem Israel out of all of his troubles. Now, actually, at the right hand of God, this is still the charge that's given to him. See, the redeem Israel out of all of his troubles. See that? And you can fellowship with Jesus in that. You know, it gives you, if you can see the... Uh, if you can see the connection between Jesus, actually in these Psalms, it actually, it actually you know, I used to just read the Psalms for comfort for myself. And, uh, and of course, that, uh, that was a good starting point because I remember I got a lot of comfort. But, but there came a time when I began to see the connection with Jesus. See, now that, see, and there's a, there's a time when you have to come to this connection. You, there's a time when you, I, I think when, you, when it's in the growing up stage in the faith, when you have to come to this place where you see this connection of Jesus, that, is, that the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is what it's all about. It's all about him. The testimony, it's all about, that doesn't mean every single verse and every single word is talking about Jesus, that, but that means that this, the, the, the spirit, the burden, the burden of this, of this revelation is all about Jesus. See, this is actually a context. See, God has sown in the earth a context where he could talk about his only begotten son. See this, so it's actually, see this is a, but see now, so we've got to, you know, we want to, now let's think about uh, Psalm 110 just for a moment. Because this is one that was quoted uh, 
uh, one of the most frequently quoted psalms. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. And then he says in verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a, thou art a priest forever, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the, the God, the Lord Jehovah, raised up and exalted his son for the purpose of dealing both with enemies and as well as those who are receiving the reconciliation. See, all, from this perspective, the enemies are those who aren't receiving the reconciliation. See, they're not just people that are committing adultery and, and stealing and things like that. I mean, that's really, from this, see, that, that, there's a whole new perspective of what sin actually is ever since sin has been put away. Sin has been put away, see? So sin has been put away, see? So the, so the, the primary sin is not receiving the son. See, that is, that is, that is the... the uh, that is the chief transgression. That's the great transgression. In the New Covenant era, that is the great transgression. Amen. Not receiving God's Son. See, that's, see you, you, can, um, you, can get, you, can, you can be perfect in all these other areas as much as you can, but see, I'll just tell you, you still go to hell if you don't have his Son. So that's, uh, it's just, uh, that's just the way it is. Now, the book of Hebrews, which labors this blessed capacity, reality to the fullest is virtually unknown in the church world and relegated to a place of little relevance. You know, I think the reason why this is that uh, this matter that the high priesthood of Jesus is, is so little known and thought about, for one thing, it's not preached, see? One thing, there's, not a, there's really not an environment where it can be preached. See, this is an otherworldly teaching. See, the, when you get into Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, you're automatically ushered into the world to come. See, that's a, so you, see now here you're, so, so it's, a, and people, people that are of this world, see, people that are of the, in the flesh, see, that's just, uh, that just is not going to appeal to them. Now, when you think about the Lord has sworn and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is another way of saying God so loved the world. When you think about that, because just think about this. Without the ministration of our great high priest, it would be impossible even for believing men and women to negotiate the course of this earthly life and to arrive safely in glory. See, because that, see, this is, uh, it's because, this, and this is because this matter of sin. See, now here, this is the, the matter of sin is of such a nature that, see, God, see, God uh, is not a respecter of persons. And God, you see, and remember Jesus said, remember he told, he says, uh, now I say unto you, my friends, I say unto you, my friends, my friends, he says, fear not him that is able to destroy the body, and after that hath nothing else that after that hath nothing he can do, but rather fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. I say unto you, fear him. Fear him. See now here that now here see now this is see this is because there is this aspect of God. See, there 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 never comes a place while we're in the flesh where we where we actually become buddies. That's, that's a poor word to use, isn't it? That's not, that's not the best word. But where we actually become so close to God that, well, God just overlooks sin. See, that's not, that, doesn't, that, can't, that does not happen, see? See, we, see the, we're in this, well, we're, that, see, God is not a, he, God, uh, he, uh, he has no, uh, he has uh, a hatred for iniquity. It's an uncompromising hatred for iniquity. It doesn't matter where it is, actually. See, he's got to see it. He's got to, but, it, but, if the iniqui, but if it's covered, see, now that's another matter. See, if the sin is covered, that's another matter. Now think about this. In, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the Isaiah uh, uh, prophecies, uh, long, starting along about um, 42 on to uh, 52, remember he talks about, my, God talks about his servant, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, God is, is so high, he's the high and lofty one. 
He's the high and lofty one. He's the, he's the holy one. And God is, is so high and lofty that he, he actually can't, he actually does, he can't, he doesn't deal with, with these, these sort of things down here. See, he just doesn't. See, he just, he commissions, he commissions, he commissions others to, to do it. And, of course, they have to be able to do it. See, he, he commissions a, someone that's able to do these things. But, but I'll tell you, when it came to, to putting away our sins, this is something that God was not able to do of himself. God the Father was not able to do this. He did not have a recourse of himself. He had to turn to his son. That was the only recourse, see? That was the only recourse. God couldn't, he, he, you know, he said, uh, he talks about forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but will in no wise acquit the guilty. Now God, uh, see, now God, see, when, now God, this the different. That almost sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? But it's not a contradiction. See, when God, God, God forgives sin on the basis of a sacrifice for sin. Yes, yes, yes. See, see, God, see, he could, he, he is, a, he has, he can have mercy and he can show compassion and he can have forgiveness wherever there's wherever there's been a blood sacrifice. See. Even one foreshadowing one that's coming, one that's to come. See now that's, uh, but see, not, but see now, just for him to acquit the guilty, just to to ignore it. See now, not even God, not even God can do that. God, that he he could, he would be denying himself. This would be this would be contrary to his person. See God, not even God can do that. Isaiah 52, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted, be very high, as many as were astonished at the astonished, we would say. His visage, his appearance was so marred, more than any of the sons of men. I, I don't believe we have a, really a view of this in the gospel accounts. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, we're, this is kind of uh, hidden from our eyes, you know, what, what was all involved. I think Isaiah is really the only one that tells us about this, but, but this is, but see what, what G, this, is the, this is from, and this brother Bob is talking about these last three hours, you know, of darkness, but but this could very well be that this, in this time that this, this beating that he took from his father because of, for our sins, he, was, he, was, he got to the, where, where he was like unrecognizable, where his, his appearance was, his visage, his appearance, he was marred. His visage, you see what I'm saying? It was unrecognizable because he was marred more than any of the sons of men. Now these are, are things that, you know, uh, we we have we have to comprehend with, by faith and and uh, it, with with tender hearts and you know this can't just be part of our theology. I mean, if this just became part of our theology, well, that would be a that would be a, a disservice to the to this whole matter. You know, Matthew eleven twenty seven, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the the Son. But the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The Father is unknowable in every respect. I'm going to deal with this in a little while. In every respect. He's unknowable in every respect. Apart from the Son. See, he's, a, he's unknowable in every respect. I mean, I, I suppose we could know his, his eternal power in Godhead, you know, but that's, uh, that, that could... Uh, that will not do us any good apart from this other, this other revelation. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. And the God of the New Testament is the same as the God of the Old Testament. I'm going to say this in Bible language now. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake 
in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. That's the way the Bible says it, right? But see, now here's, this is a, now here we've got it. Now we've, now we've got the way the Bible says it. See, now here's the, it's good when we can, of course, we want to be able to button things down with something. It's good when we can just button something down like that with what God said. See, this, we want to think about things in the way that God said it. See, we want to be able to just, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Later on it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I say these things with the, uh, the intent and purpose of encouraging larger and more worthy thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men perish because they have small thoughts of, of Jesus, and they flourish wherever their vi vision of him is increasing by the grace of God. We live and flourish in the wounds of Jesus. I'll just tell you, it's a, this, in, this, in, this wounds, in these wounds of Jesus, it's just like going through the, the, into the, the, the curtain of the tabernacle. You know, you, you just get into these wounds. You know, you just like rub against these wounds, these wounds of the Son of God. You know, this, this is where the, this is where the, this is where the cleansing in. This is, this is where the cleansing from all unrighteousness, in the, in the wounds of Jesus. See, this is, well, you, you know, faith, you understand what I mean by that. I don't, Sins were punished in Christ, the last Adam, to the full satisfaction of God the Father. And now God's redeemed sons and daughters have been raised to walk in newness of life in Christ, the second man. He is the beginning of the creation of God. This is an essential component of justification in Christ and of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit witnesses to men's spirits that this is so. Now see, that, this is how it works. See, the Holy Spirit is, he bears witness. He bears witness with our spirit, see. He bears witness that we're the sons of God. See, now here, see, the Holy Spirit is the witnesser. See, he's the one, he's the one that has beheld these things and he effectually witnesses them to your spirit, see. That's, the, that's how they, otherwise you wouldn't know this, see. You would, well, you might know it in your, as far as head knowledge, see, but, but see, as far as un, actually getting a hold of this in your heart. See, the Holy Spirit effectualizes these things to your spirit, see. Amen. God purposes all things after the counsel of his will, of his own will. The Son executes that counsel and accomplishes it, and the Holy Spirit testifies that these things are so. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, here's just some, here when we think about the Father and the Son, let's just think about, just think about this, this is, these, this is what I'm talking about, this Bible language, see, this language of the, related to the Father and the Son. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God has demonstrated commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. See, now here, this is, now here, this, now just, if we just absorb this language into us, he will have a proper view of the Godhead. See what I'm saying? This is exactly, this is how we're to view the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's from the, from these words of scripture. See, now we just, we take these words into us and this is our view of, of, the, and this is the, this is the view that is, that is the, well, it's the, this is the view that, that will do you good. It'd be profitable to you. Hereby we know that we dwell in him because he hath given us his spirit. We dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ 
declared to his apostles, and I will pray the Father. How about this? Now listen to this language. I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it, ha it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. Remember Jesus said, uh, remember he said regarding the sending the Holy Spirit, he says, lo, I will come unto you. Remember, see, so there, see, now there's language. See, now here, just take that language into yourself, your spirit. See, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this, is part of our, this is part of our view of these things, right? See, this is, you see what I'm saying? This is, this is not lo, I will come unto you. See, we just, now we've got, now we've got God's view of it, right? We've got Jesus' view, we've got God's view, and this is the, the Holy Spirit's view, and this is the way we ought to view it. See, this is a, uh, now, the following declarations of Scripture are marvelous to consider, especially for, for those, those who know somewhat of the exceeding sinfulness of sin and of the devastating moral havoc that sin has wreaked upon our race, for those who know firsthandedly the lament expressed by Paul in Romans 7 and where that lament has become their lament, and who know the Father's absolute abhorrence and intolerance regarding sin, these are truly blessed affirmations. At first, each of these almost seem too good to be true. Each is, as it were, an emancipation proclamation to the pure in heart, even to the soul that is seeking God, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But that which may not be at first apparent is that each of these glorious provisions was paid for in full with in incomprehensible sufferings. Even the sufferings of Christ, the stroke of divine judgment and wrath that was due unto us fell upon Jesus. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now, just think about this. Think about some of these expressions that I'm talking about. Now, I just landed on some of them, and you, you know, here I'm speaking, speaking to Bible people here, you know many, many more of these, but just think about this now. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Well, I'll tell you, it was there. But God didn't see it because he saw it in his only begotten son. He saw it when he, when he, la when he laid our sins upon him on the tree, see? He saw it and punished it in Jesus, see? Now you can't, there can't be, you can't punish it twice, see? Now that's the, see, that's part of the, uh, that would be what they call double jeopardy in the, in the, cor in the, in the courts of, of the land, right? The, you can't punish, a sin can't be punished twice, or a, a crime can't be punished twice. It can't, that would be, see, that, see, now that's the way God's government works. See, now it was punished in Jesus, so it can't be punished in you. See, now that's, see that, but see, now faith has got to get a hold of this. See, faith has to, to get a hold of this and behold this. See that he hath not beheld iniquity. Didn't, see now, he, do, he doesn't. How can that be? Well, see now he saw it, but see now this ought to, see this, we want to think about Jesus when we think about things like this, see. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Forgiveness and iniquity and transgression and sin has, has for its base, basis an acceptable blood sacrifice. Even the Lamb for, of God, which has taken away the sin of the world, God forgives wherever men are stirring up their hearts to take hold of him. Of course, this is evidence that he's already been working in them. But, but, the, but see now, but see now we, don't, we don't have to always backtrack and say that because, uh, because that was, you know, this is language in the prophets, right? He said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord or stirs up his heart to take hold of him. See now, now, see now we, understand, we understand, we're talking to Bible people here that, you know, that we understand the involvements of, what, of God working in the background here. But, but here, uh, you, you all know what I'm talking about? We, we, uh, we, stirring up your hearts. This, this is like a... We, that's what calling on the name of the Lord is. It's not just saying a little prayer. It's, it's stirring up your heart to take a hold of God. Take a hold of, take a hold of his son. See, and take a hold of his salvation. Psalm 103. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. 
nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I'll tell you, they were, they had to go somewhere. And they did go somewhere. And you know, you know where I'm, where I'm, I'm going. He removed our, our transgressions from us to his suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why they're not here. You know, your spirit actually bears witness to the fact, see, that he's removed them, right? He bear, he, your, your spirit actually bears witness to this fact. I remember reading this years ago, and it bore witness to this fact, even when I didn't understand it. But, but nevertheless, that's, I didn't understand all the involvements of it. But nevertheless, this is why. See, this is why the Spirit could witness, witness these comforting, these consolatory uh, considerations. These, uh, you, as we think about these things, you know, that it's so, so comforting and, you know, uh, you know to, to think that he's removed them as, as far as the east is, is from the west. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, and though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I'll tell you, sins were never so glaringly scarlet nor crimson as when the Lord Jesus Christ, when, when God laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. They were glaringly scarlet. I'll tell you, they, those, those, they were glaringly scarlet. They were glaringly crimson. I'll tell you, they were crimson, as crimson as they could be. When they, were, when they were laid upon Jesus, I'll tell you they were. God saw them all. He saw them all. He saw the whole mass of sin when he, lay, when they, when he, laid, them, when he laid them upon his son. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Isn't that something? Now, here's an effect. Now, here you, here's, a, here's something. This, this effect, you, you sense, you, you feel within yourself that this, this effect has taken place, that you live unto righteousness. See, you, so we, we live unto righteousness, but, but this is because sins have been put away. Amen. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Now for the rebuke of his people to be taken away, the Lord Jesus Christ had to rebear the rebuke of his father. Now this, see, this is the, this is, there's, no, there's no getting around this. See, he, he had to suffer rebuke from his father. But not personal rebuke, it was rebuke because of our sin. See, this is, he was rebuked because of, he suffered, he the, the reproaches of them that reproached thee had fallen on Jesus. See, this was, uh, and the same with the rebuke. Art thou know it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the, in the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Now this passageway to glory is a way that was purchased with the blood of God's only Son. His only begotten Son, it is a blood-stained way. It's even the way of the cross. See, this, see there's no getting around this. We've got to see, we've see the, we want to see the connection between, see these, these, uh, these, glory, these exceeding great and precious promises, see they were all purchased. They were purchased with incomprehensible suffering. See, that's... Uh, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, Jeremiah 33, 8, whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, whereby they have against, transgressed against me. This is talking God talking to his covenanted people. This is talking about Israel here. Talking about, he's, not, he's talking about those that have joined themselves to him by a covenant. This cleansing and pardon came at the expense of the offering of Jesus Christ up for a, once for all. Now think about this one here in Jeremiah 50, 20. In those days, and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. 
and the sins of Judah shall, be, shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Now, that, see, that's good language to take within yourself, too. I will pardon them whom I reserve. See, now, this is a... See, that, see, these ones that, see, God, is, he's, he's saved for himself a remnant. See, those are the ones he's pardoning, see. See, see I'm going to pardon those whom I reserve. Now, those are the ones who are believing on his son. See, there's, let's make no mistake about it. There's no, there's a, we don't want to introduce any confusion here. This is a, those who have, have believed on the son of God, those who are in Christ, or those who he has, whom he has reserved, reserved for himself. Amen. Just a couple more of these uh, I will strengthen the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring again, bring them again to the, to, I will bring them again to place them. For I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. I'll tell you that is a, those are that's a marvelous word. Amen. But he had cast off his only begotten son. There was a, pe- a, a price that had to be paid. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now think about this. In preaching the gospel, we are announcing the accomplishments of Jesus from the heavenly perspective more so than what appeared to be a transpiring on Golgotha. Now there is a, there's certainly a place to... Uh, to, to minister the, uh, the record, that the precise record of what transpired in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Don't misunderstand me. But you know, when, when it comes to the power, when you, want, you, want, when you, want, when you want power unto to edification and power unto, uh, unto salvation and, and putting, da- putting away of sin and, re- and renouncing unrighteousness, see, now this kind of power, see, now this... This comes in the proclamation of, of what, what Jesus actually did. Now, you know what? This, this actually shows, is a demonstration of the love of Christ itself. That, you know, uh, you know if, he were, if he were selfish, he could say, well, how come you don't talk about more what, what, what Pilate did to me? And how come you don't talk more about what, the, what they did, you know, when, when I was on the, on the cross there? You know, what they did to me? You know, why, see, no, that, see, now that isn't... Uh, that isn't what that isn't what Jesus would want. See, now he would he would he uh, we we want to have a faithful representation of the record there. Don't misunderstand me. We want to, and there is profit to be derived from that. There is, there is to be sure, and uh, and I don't want to under, underestimate the profit that can be drawn from there because uh, the, I, I certainly don't want to muddy up the waters when I say this. Let's think about some insurmountable dilemmas that have been. Blessedly resolved by God in the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. First of all, when we talk about divine dilemmas, we're, we speak of, when we speak of dilemmas or impasses or predicaments, if I could use that word, with regard to the Most High, we must be careful to affirm that with Him they are circumstances, settings, environments, that have been conceived by him, who is the all-wise eternal God, and who are self-imposed by him for the glorification of his holy name and for the making known among principalities and powers in heavenly places his manifold wisdom. And this is in accordance with the eternal purpose which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus. Through these things he would make known to both men and angels why the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely essential in the recovering of his banished sons and daughters. Amen. Now let's just think of the language of dilemma here in the, in the scripture here. Now remember he said, uh, he said after Adam had sinned, he says, Adam, where art thou? God asked this question. That was a dilemma. See, the Satan, at least Satan thought it was, boy, Satan thought I really got him, got him in a dilemma here, right? So, but he said, where art thou? See, Adam had sinned. Where art thou? What are we going to do about this? And then he said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? So, and then he said to Israel, 
What could, I, what could have been done more to my vineyard than, than that I have not done in it? Wherefore, I looked that it should, not, should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And we talk about uh, raising uh, sons and daughters up unto the Lord, and I'll tell you, I want to just digress here for a moment and, and, and commend all the precious sons and daughters of Zion that are here, comparable to fine gold. Uh, I I've really been edified and, and uh, ministered to by each one of you that came up and sang or, uh, or uh, spoke in front of the congregation. Now he said here in uh, Isaiah again, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. It's a divine dilemma. Therefore his, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. Now here's, a, here's some words about resolving this dilemma. Now this is the language of the scripture here. And this is taken, uh, you know, from the, the language, 2 Corinthians, 2 Samuel 14, 14. This is a good, this is easy one to remember because it's 14, 14, right? So, but uh, neither does God uh, respect any person, neither doth he devise means where that his, yet, yet doth he de devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. See, now that's, uh, that's encapsulates, that's, that encapsulates in a nutshell what God is doing in the gospel. See, he has devised means, see, in the, in the, it, that his banish be not expelled from him. You know, a Adam and Eve were, uh, they weren't cast into hell after they had sinned. They were just cast out of the garden. The, the angels that sinned were cast into hell, right? But, they, but Adam and Eve, they were just, they were, uh, they were rebuked given a promise, and then cast out of the garden. And the, uh, for, uh, you know, in, in the angels, the cherubim kept the, the way to the tree of life, you know, that, that, that no man could enter in there. But they weren't cast into hell. So there, there's a, you know, there's a difference between being banished and being expelled. So uh, that his banished be not expelled. See, the, you know, the, you, you can be banished and... Actually, we all started out in a state of banishment, right? But, yeah, but see, you, this, uh, but we're, uh, but see, the, but the expulsion would be the, would be of a, of a, of a, of a permanent nature, right? And this would be, he's, God has devised means that this, that his, that his, uh, his banished be not expelled from him. His banished, his banished. And Paul expresses it this way, whom the Lord God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now I want to think about some of these uh, these. Uh, Things that were brought to, uh, into be, uh, into pass, brought to pass, and introduced because of the entrance of sin into the world. And you know, in most fundamental theologies, even the best of them, I think they oversimplify the matter of what actually transpired when when sin, when uh, when sin entered into the world. Uh, you know, they, the, I think the best ones they say, "Well, God is holy, and and the gospel is made." You know, provision for that, and that, this is absolutely true. You know, I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm just saying that there's more to it than that. And God is, he's, God is righteous, and and so and men are unrighteous, and God has made provision for that. But let's think about, let's think about the the thing, the different things that the the undoing that sin actually brought. It sin actually undid a lot of things. It undid a lot of things that needed to be that need to be brought back together, and they've been brought back together by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now God is thrice holy, and by nature men are unholy, especially those, those in, uh, since, uh, since sin has entered into the world, and they all are as an unclean thing and drink iniquity like water. 
But Christ is holy and he's harmless and he's undefiled. See, so he's just, he is the savior. He's just the perfect savior that we need. See, he's, a, he's holy, he's harmless, and he's undefiled. God is altogether righteous, the righteous Lord who loveth righteousness. But when diligent search was made by him among the sons of men, it's, it is said that there was none righteous. No, not one. But, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the Lord our righteousness, right? And he's been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctifi sanctification, and redemption. See, he's, he's, that's, that's, a, that's a, a wonderful uh, topic in itself. How about this? Now, God is eternal, and men are mortal. How, are, how, are these, how is this going to be rectified? I mean, how is this? See, see what I mean? We've got more things involved here, but I'll tell you that, behold... Bethlehem Ephrata, thou who art the least among the cities of Judah, out of thee shall come a governor and a ruler whose, whose, of whose, whose ways are of old and of everlasting. See, now this is going to resolve this matter of the mortality. See, he's in, this is going to this resolve this, this matter of, of the mortality and bringing, bringing men back to God. And the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, um, but men are such lowly, sinful creatures. Some perceive it to the glory of God, and some do not. But Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And he says, come unto me. You just come unto me, you that, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You're, I mean, we're, we're not talking about labors like in the world. We're talking about labor. You're, you're laboring over the, you know, the burden of sin. This, this kind of labor, you, this, this kind of labor, this is the kind of labor he's talking about where, you, where sin has become a burden to you. See, you actually, you, you, you realize that you've sinned and you've got, you need, you, you're not able to deal with it, quite frankly. And so, but he says, come unto me. You come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. God is a God of purpose. And Christ, the one, is the one in whom God's eternal purpose resides. God is almighty. Christ is the king of glory. God is all wise. Christ is made unto us wisdom. God is true. Jesus is the truth. Even though all men are liars, see, God is true and all men are liars, but Jesus is the truth. See, now here's the, this is the, this is the, the, the means of recovery. God is a spirit, but Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And there's, there's, others, there's others that... Uh, I want to just, uh, in, as we start to draw this to a close, probably exceeded my limit here, but... I want to talk about vicarious sufferings. I know this is, this is impinging a little bit on Brother Jason's topic, but I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about it too. And... Uh, You know, uh, vicarious is not a Bible word, but nevertheless, it, it graphically expresses a Bible thought. And there's sometimes when uh, it's in order to, to use words that assist us, uh, you know, if, if they don't, if they, if they don't uh, burden us down, if they don't distract us, if they help us, if the words are helpers and not distractors, well, then it's in order. See, but... If, 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 the, if the stuff we're bringing in is uh, it's a distraction and we've got to throw it off in order to see what, what this is all about, well, then, then that's not profitable, see? But, but see, now here, this, think about this with regard to uh, vicarious. In Scripture, the thought of vicariousness is expressed by the simple preposition for. Christ died for us. Christ died for us for sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. He was wounded for our transgressions. Christ died for sins. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. Now, vicarious access to God 
and vicarious life through Christ. This thought is also in the scripture, uh, not, uh, it's, well, it's expressed like this. And this was manifest, fested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's vicarious. See what I'm saying? We're living through him. It's in the, through the means of another. See, we're, living, we're, coming into, we're coming into God in the behalf of another. It's kind of like uh, Jacob, Jacob and Esau, right? When Jacob, uh, was, uh, he, had the, was the, the, he had the cloth of his brother on the... And it, you, remember, you remember that? I'm, I don't want to distract with the details there, but... We shall be saved from wrath through him. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Let's think about, I'm, I'm bringing this to a close knob. <clears throat> Death or chastisement. Now wherever and whenever men sin, a death is required. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Incidentally, chastening or chastisement are in no way a retribution for sin. It's not, this is not God paying you back. This is not what it's all about. See, this is, uh, I'll tell you, if God was paying you back, you wouldn't be here. You know, this was, uh, see, this is, uh, if, God, if, it, if that was really the basis, you, you, you would have perished a long, long time ago. I mean, you would, uh, we wouldn't be here to talk about it, right, if God was paying us back. See, that, I mean, that's the, we're talking about the enormity of sin. We're talking about the, see, the, now, now people have a, have a tendency to, you know, to, to, to think glibly about these things. And, but chastening is rather for, the, for correction, for God's people anyhow. It's for correction and the purpose of vindicating God before principalities and powers in his righteous dealings with men. Now, you've got to see this. Now, remember when, he, when uh, I think of the two classic examples of David and Paul. But uh, remember, David uh, was a man after God's own heart. But when David sinned with Bathsheba, God chastened him till the day he died with, uh, with different things that transpired in his family. But nevertheless, he said uh, he was still a man after God's own heart. See, he, that, see, he, was, he still he, he retained his uh, love for the Lord and, his, and God retained his love for him. But it, was, uh, but it was still, you see what I'm saying, that God, but this was to, to vindicate God, that God doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't overlook sin. Apostle Paul is the other classic example. Jesus said to him, I will show you what great things you must suffer for my name's sake. I'm going to show you, Paul. But nevertheless, in the sa at the same time, God gave him an abundance of revelation. Now, only God can do that, see? Now, now Paul was, he was shipwrecked, and he was stoned, and he was... He was, uh, he was a day and the night he was in the deep sea. And, but, but see, now only God, only God can do things like this. He, does it, he did it simultaneously in Paul, and he can do it simultaneously in, in, in us too, you know, to our, in our measure. You know, this, I think we, we see this, this is the working of God. It's not the working of Paul. It's the working of, this is how God works, see? We're talking about how God works. See what I'm saying? These are the... God is vindicating. He's vindicating his name that he doesn't, you know, judgment must begin at the house of God. And it, if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, see, this is God vindicating his holy name. Now, another, uh, another uh, English word that expresses the, this thought of vicariousness is substitute. And uh, every man who would draw near to God must eventually be brought to this very pensive consideration 
Is it verity, veritably possible that someone could take my place? I mean, I, I, know, I know we've all come to that conclusion, but I'm, I'm just saying we want, you want to retrace those steps. You want to, you want to is, it, is it possible? I know, now here, here I know we know it's possible. I know, and it, and it is. I, I know, I, we're not, I'm just saying that we don't want to, we, don't want, we want to be people that have thought these things through. We want to be people that have really thought these things through. Is it possible? Is it possible that someone could take my place? Yes, it is possible. It's not only possible, but this is what God has done in the gospel. This is what, this is what he's done in the gospel of his only begotten son. This is absolute, precisely and absolutely what he's done. Somebody has taken our place. See, see now somebody has taken our place, right? So, but see, now we want to think this, you want to think it through like that. So, you know, and say, yes, yes, he has taken my place. Now, my, my, one of my closing thoughts here is uh, this vicariousness is a form of the word vicar, V-I-C-A-R. One of the common uses of it is, uh, is, a, is a blasphemous, you know, like the vicar at Rome and things like this, like God's represent, you know, uh, representative on earth. But, but I'll tell you, that's a blasphemous uh, use of the word, so let's, let's just blot that one out, okay? But let's think about this. How about the Holy Spirit is Christ's vicar upon earth? Amen. Or how about Christ was our vicar on the cross? Amen. He took our place, right? That's right? He took our place. He took all of our place. Not just, not just some of us, but he took all of our place, right? He was our vicarious. See, we're talking about the word vicarious. Mm -hmm. Vicarious. That's what we're talking about, vicarious suffering, see? Well, anyhow, those are, uh, those are the things that I had.